This episode is brought to you by Control N Consulting, where innovation meets expertise. We specialize in a range of services, including analysis and planning, custom software development, project management, as well as training and support. Our team is dedicated to ensuring the highest standards in quality assurance and testing. Choose Control and Consulting as your go-to partner for digital transformation and experience solutions tailored to propel your business forward. We have uh, MJ, a fellow actuary. Actuary. Actuary, yeah. Actuary, yeah. Uh, MJ is quite a busy, multifaceted individual. You're a consultant, um, a goal-cutting enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Are you pro yet? Well, I'm trying to become champion next year. Ah, okay. So, so I guess I guess I could call myself pro, but until I until I get it, I yeah. guess I could always say yeah, a bit more on the amateur front. But mm. yes, the goal for next year is to is to yeah, get into the championship. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We'll talk about that. Uh, MJ also has two YouTube channels. One is MJ the Actually Fellow. The Actually Fellow. The, the Fellow Actually. The yeah. Fellow Actually. Fellow Actually. The second one is Bible Intelligence. Yes. yes. MJ. Thank you for doing this, man. No, thank you for, for having me. Yeah. Cool. So for those of us who might or might not know, who is MJ? Who is MJ? It's it's an interesting one because I mean my full name is Michael Jordan. So I've always had people, you know, making jokes about my my name. I was even in Korea last year. And this old man couldn't speak any English, but he sees my name tag and he does this like little basketball gesture, <laughs> you know, throwing it in. So I've always had like, yeah, so I think people always remember my my name. Mm -hmm. And then for the past four years, a, a lot of people think I look like Ed Sheeran. So whenever I'm walking around town, every now and again, I'll have someone, like even at Seapoint, they had that open street festival. Yeah. I had someone walk past and be like, hey, Ed, Ed. So... It's always weird when you say, you know, who who are you? And you've got like so many different people seeing you as oh, either Michael Jordan associate with the basketball player or I resemble Ed Sheeran, the singer. Um, but I guess it's, it's a nice way of kind of like looking at, you know, I like to dabble in extremes, different things. So it makes sense that I've compared to a basketball player and, uh, and, and a singer. That speaks to what you are actually involved, the things you do, eh? Yes, yeah. yes. But it was funny because, I mean, I engage a lot with with AI and I was talking to AI the other day uh, to say to it, you know, what is my worldview? Because <laughs> Hold on. You were talking to AI the other day. Yes, yes. That so, just sounds You know do you know what I love about wrong. AI? Is you were talking to AI the other day. AI replies, you know, you message some girls, <laughs> <laughs> you message some of them. <laughs> You've got to wait two days. AI, Facts. you know, within twenty seconds you've you've got this reply. And it's a fascinating one because, you know, a lot of people try and define who you are by, you know, your star sign or what is your personality type. Right. And I was when I was interacting with the AI, I was trying to get like, what is my my worldview? You know, like what is the way that I see this world? And I guess that is more associated with who I am. Mm -hmm. And I mean, ultimately, AI came back and says, you've got a very unique blend, um, but it's very much Christian with like a bit of a, how would I say, there's, there's a there's a fancy term for it called tychism, which is tychism. Prob I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it's yeah. it's like the Greek word for uncertainty. So I have a worldview that is Christian, but understands that randomness is part of reality. So for me, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, mm. compared to say a lot of people who say no. If you know everything today, then you'll know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm. Like more of that mm. deterministic mm. vibe. So I would say. Yeah, who's MJ? I'd say a Christian with a fascination around uncertainty. Christian with a fascination around uncertainty. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. All right, cool. So how did you get into actuary? And what is that? Just mm. yeah. So so actuaries we try to make sense of an uncertain future. And you can see it's it's definitely influenced my yeah, my worldview. Um, so it was weird. When I was a kid, I just wanted to become a preacher. So right. a preacher was my, my number one job, you know, career. I think number two I put as a kid was to become a sports manager. You know, I love playing FIFA. I kind of thought, oh, I can't play soccer, but I could maybe but manage, I could manage, yeah, I could yeah. manage a team. Yeah. Um, and the parents were like, no, no, you can't, you can't become a preacher. You can't become a sports manager. You have to enter the profession. So they said I could choose the profession but I had to become a professional. So my whole life I was like, okay, 
I'm going to become an accountant. I like lawyer, but my dad's a lawyer. When I said to him, dad, I want to become a lawyer. He's like, no, Michael, you're, you're too emotional to become a lawyer. And I just started crying. I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and he's like, well, there you go. So my dad kind of persuaded me not to become a lawyer, even though absolutely fascinated by it. Shame I like quiz him on a million mm. questions every day, every time I get. So I was going to become an accountant. My brother's an accountant. And right at the last minute, you know, we had a family friend who said, hey, Michael's good at maths. He should become an actuary. So I just said, what? Oh, it pays well and it's difficult. Sign so me up. So before then you didn't know what that was? I didn't know what it did. I, didn't, yeah. I mean, because it was actuarial science, I was, and you know, the word science it's is science, in it. Yeah. I was expecting to do physics. I thought maybe there'd be a class on chemistry. Mm. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And just as well, because I got in and I actually ended up really, really enjoying it. So actuaries have got two primary functions in the insurance world. We mm -hmm. determine how much an insurance uh, product should cost, you know, the premium, like how to calculate it depending on your age and your health and various other factors. Mm -hmm. And also we determine how much money an insurance company should hold back at any given time so that if you come and claim, the insurance company has enough money to, to pay for that claim. And then I would go on to do my specializing in how to invest those reserves. Right. So it's very similar to what I did was like CFA level three and maybe financial risk management. It was, yeah, investing on behalf of an institution. Mm. I never actually ended up doing that because you can imagine, I think I was 25 when I fully qualified. And there's no way Sunlum or Old Mutual were going to call me up and be like, hey, what stock should we buy? You know, <laughs> they're not going to ask a 25 year old. We have this there. money here. We need to make a plan. Yeah. So my, <laughs> my very first job um, was actually building back end systems for insurance companies. And the boss had a motto where he said, it's easier to teach actuaries programming than programmers actuarial science, just because of the nuance with around statistics and, and that okay. kind of thing. Look, I think he was wrong because I really struggled to program these back-end systems. Mm. But it was at this company that I got exposure to to AI and like a lot more crypto. Even the job interview question, they said to me, what is Bitcoin? So this is 2014, job interview question, they say, what is Bitcoin? Mm. Back then, all I was like, could say was like internet pirate gold. You know, that's that was my ultimate understanding. But working there with a lot of programmers, I'd get yeah, a lot of exposure to to crypto. And then ultimately, when I left that job, I went and I made my first AI. It was a very simple AI. Yeah. I played rock, paper, scissors. Um, but it followed like all the principles of what an AI is. Like it was thinking on its own. It could determine its own parameters and that. Yeah. And the South African Journal of Science actually published the article I wrote on it. So that was really, really cool. And then I started getting into almost a form of using AI in like a reversed way. So I started teaching um, actuarial science. And the idea was, can I take AI and reverse engineer the way a computer learns into the ultimate study method? And this is where I would learn about this concept called semantics. And semantics mm. is all about how knowledge pieces itself together. And that was pretty cool. I did a TED talk at UCT on semantic learning. Even during COVID, I won a government tender to create a like a, a course on insurance using the semantic stuff. So I was doing some teaching and then, yeah, as you said, consultant, yeah. love tech. So I then started consulting to companies about how to use technology, everything from automation, machine learning. Mm -hmm. And then I went and worked for a crypto company. So I would talk to insurance companies about how they could use the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward to where we are now, um, I fortunately did well during COVID, just from my investing uh, learnings. They always told us like when there's a crash, the market overreacts. So when COVID, you know, hit the markets and all the shares went down, yeah. I went super aggressive. I was like, either the world's going to end and I'm not going to need money oh. or this thing's going to bounce back it's up. It's going to bounce back, yeah. And it did bounce back up. So I'm now in a fortunate situation where I don't have to work as an actuary. I can now do my, my own thing, my own startup, which is now using AI mm. to create Bible content. So I'm, I'm coming back to being a preacher. Being a preacher. So I'm, I'm yeah, heading yeah. back to my, yeah. my roots. So with all that is, all the possible um, career paths, right? Mm -hmm. What would you say you don't like the most about actual? I think the thing I didn't like the most was working for someone. So I do have that unfortunate personality trait okay. where I don't just take orders from the superior. I'll take orders if the orders are logical, they make sense, and they're 
you know, they're a saint. But if they just tell me to do something, I'm not just going to do it. I will push back and I want to know why. Why must I do this? Why must I do that? Mm. And that caused a bit of friction with, you know, your supervisors or your managers because they didn't want to take the time to explain why I had to do something. They were just like, get it done. Right. So there was a little bit of a, a power struggle in in that regard. And I think that's what I really like about being now like an entrepreneur mm. is just that freedom to do my own thing um, and know that everything I'm doing has a bit more meaning towards it. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say as an actuary, because actuaries – we very rarely are the CEOs of businesses. We very much, you know, we have a boss telling us what to do. Yeah, yeah. You've got to listen to the shareholders, the board, you know, you are working for these insurance companies. And I think, yeah, that part of the job, I just didn't, didn't appeal mm. too much to me. Mm. You don't hear a lot about actuaries. Like you hardly just bump into them like, hey, this guy's an actuary. Why, why is that? So I think there's the stereotypical answer that actuaries are socially awkward, you know, and that's maybe very true of the older actuaries. Uh, the younger actuaries are a little bit more outgoing. You are not socially awkward. So <laughs> That is, no, it's not. Okay. Um, but I think it's it's one of those degrees that is very difficult to to obtain because it requires intelligence on multiple fronts. So a lot of people come to actuarial science because they're told, oh, you have to be good at maths. You only do maths for the first three years. And then you get into something called actuarial judgment because, yes, you're building these actuarial models, you're using yeah. computers, you're using maths, but there isn't like an answer like, oh, I just applied this formula to that formula and I get it. You've got to use your your judgment. You've got mm. to discern what are my assumptions going to be? Should I have inflation as a variable? Should I have it as a deterministic thing? Like how should I actually do this? And sometimes you change one little thing and it can be very, very sensitive and impacted. So – what tended to happen was you had students who were very, very good at maths. And then when we got to this actuarial judgment, you know, writing reports, essays, trying to debate, give a give an answer, mm -hmm. you know, persuade the board why they shouldn't take a huge dividend, but rather they actually have to, ha you know, save their money. You have to be convincing in that kind of front. A lot of people tapped out. And so actuarial science, unfortunately, is misrepresented as being purely mathematical. And so a lot of students that come then fall out. Yeah. And then I think yeah, the other reason, yeah, so I don't think there's there's that many of us and we're a little bit socially awkward. But three, it's because we're very much at the back of the scenes. You know, a doctor, when you watch a movie, there's the doctor, he's got the patient on the table and he saves the life, or the lawyer, he's in the courtroom, it's very dramatic and the sense and things happening. The actuary is just, you know, on their laptop. Mm. <laughs> and yes, the models that they're doing are being put in place to make sure that our societies have the funds required if a catastrophe occurs. You know, so we are saving the world in our own way, but we're doing it in a very unglamorous way. And that's mm. why I don't think there's many movies are made out of us. Not many things are done. And also, like, I think there's a, you know, it's difficult to explain exactly how we come to our answer. You know, everyone sees the lawyer debating and using their words or the doctor, you know, doing their, their thing in the surgery. As an actor, it's very difficult to show. You yeah. Know, it doesn't make yeah. for good TV just seeing just it on a laptop. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of overlap between actuaries and accountants when you just a, a, a Google like, you know, what is this and that. What, how, how are those two professions different? Mm. So... I kind of feel like just how every single business has an accountant, I feel it would be beneficial if every single company also had an actuary. Where, and because we both play on the balance sheet. Accountants, okay, they're the ones that draw up the balance sheet and audit it and do all that. And they focus very much on the asset side. So they mm -hmm. say, okay, this is the property we own. These are the investments we have. This is how much money we're going to make. The actuaries, we're very good at focusing on the liability side. You mm -hmm. know. What are our future expenses? What are our obligations? What are what happens if you know we lose an income stream? So, for example, if a lot of companies had actuaries working for them during COVID, yeah. those actuaries could have come in and said, "Oh, listen here, you're going to close your shop, but you're still going to be obligated to pay salaries or pay rent or do this or do that." So your liability side of the of the balance sheet is going to not looking really good. You know, ring the alarm bells. Let's do something about mm -hmm. it. Whereas an accountant is more on the, you know, do 
do we have enough money? Is the balancing kind of done? Mm. I guess a, a nice way to, to show it is, is the story of PayPal. And not many people know that it was actually an actuary that saved PayPal. And what happened was Elon Musk had a friend, a guy called Rulof Buerta, yeah, who was the youngest qualified actuary. And Elon's like, dude, I need you in my team. You're a smart actuary. Come join PayPal. So he's working at PayPal, and he's just calculating the risk of fraud. How how old is PayPal at this time? PayPal's young. Yeah. This is this is like early, early, early days. I think okay. this, so that they're, they're like in their twenties. And this guy's doing all the calculations, and he's like, wow, every month the calculations are wrong. What we expected to happen and what actually happening, hmm. it's different and it's growing. So Roloff says, you know what? I'm going to throw away this model that's being prescribed and I'm going to bring in an actuarial model, something known as the chain ladder method, which is used for insurance companies to calculate claims that have incurred but haven't been reported. And he just sees that the pattern links up that this would be a more appropriate model. So he uses this model and it freaks him out. He goes to Elon and everyone. He says, guys, fraud is coming. It's going to be huge. It's going to be a wave. It's going to wipe us out. So he sounds the alarm bells. So what do PayPal do? They set up those annoying capture things. You know, yeah. you have to click all the... I'm not the, a robot. I'm not a robot. <laughs> all the things like that. And they, they set up a big reserve fund. So that instead of them taking profit and all that, they start setting up reserves. They ask the investors to set up some cushions and all this stuff. What happens? The fraud wave comes. Mm. It hits because you can imagine fraud. Someone steals money or they double spend or they do something. People only realize like a week or something later yeah. that, you know, something's yeah. happened with PayPal. It's not like, oh, you're getting mugged. Someone gives a gun, give mm. me your wallet. Mm. With PayPal, it can happen and only when you come to check on it. So PayPal sets up all of these things. The fraud wave hits and PayPal is able to survive. But all their competitors, I mean, think about it. What, what, what's a PayPal competitor? Can you think of a PayPal competitor from back in the day? Exactly. They all get wiped out because they didn't have an actuary. Yeah. And therefore, now PayPal, this fraud wave, basically washes out their competition. They now have basically a monopoly, and they would go on to become this huge and successful company. And again, it's one of these things where an actuary saved the day, and but isn't part of that main story. To be honest, I've never heard of that guy. So guess what he's doing today? Probably and, saving another PayPal someone. So he now has $1 trillion under his asset management. Oh, he has a... So he has a fund now. DC fund. It's called... I always mispronounce oh, it. Management. Yeah, it's called Sequoia... Sequoia, Sequoia Cap Capital. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So he's he kind of runs that now. Oh. And I mean, when I was working at the blockchain company last year, Polygon, his company came in and just, you know, casual $400 million investment here, there, elsewhere. So no, he and but again, he's li he lives in the shadows. Actually, he's mm. very much in the shadows, in the background. You know, they don't like the limelight. Uh, but yes, it's definitely a a powerful degree yeah. because it teaches you to think about what are the possible futures that could happen tomorrow yeah. and how to prepare for them today. Well, think about it. If you know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow or you have an idea what might happen, you're in a very strong position on how to play the game. Mm, like mm, imagine true, playing chess true, and true. knowing that the person's going to move there. You know, Advantage okay. all the time. Yeah, yeah. And you set that up. So how long have you been consulting now? So I started consulting, it was, was it 2017 or 2018? And how, how is that going? So, you know, consulting, it's a, it's a challenging one because sometimes you, you get into that exact situation that I didn't like being with the employee because mm -hmm. you'll get a client and then they'll sometimes, you know, treat you like an employee. Like an employee, yep. Um, and that kind of happened with the last client that I had um, earlier this year. Which So when they came to like renew the terms and were like, hey, you know, we want to get you for another 50 hours or something like this, I was just like, no, no, I'm, I'm actually going to focus on my, my entrepreneurship thing. Consulting, it's, it's great because you get to give your input, you get to jump in, do mm -hmm. your stuff, and you're not involved too much with the company drama, which is great. But another thing I didn't like about it was you're building somebody else's dream. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, I put a lot of hard work, a lot of hard effort. And, yes, you get paid well. You do get compensated. Yeah. But, like I say, I'm in that position now where I'm like, let me rather build my my own dream. And that's where, yeah, like I say, coming back to using AI to try help me, yeah, set up some sort of preaching online mis uh, missionary. Mm, mm. And, yeah, it's it's been fun so far. I've only been doing this since May. 
Since May. Yeah, so it's, what ah. is that? Six, seven months. Do you see it going for some time? So it's it's what I want to do indefinitely. Indefinitely. Yeah. So another nice thing about actuarial science is they teach you to think long term. So like when we're looking at liabilities of say insurance companies, we're looking at time spans of say forty years. You know, so where a lot of sometimes companies think in five years, ten years, mm-hmm. actuaries were thinking forty years, how interest rates gonna change. You know, you've got a very long term mm-hmm. horizon. Mm-hmm. And you can't just help but apply that now to your own life. So I kinda looked at it and you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that when I retire. Mm. Or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that when... And I'm like, "Mm mm-mm. Yeah. Why not do your dream now and do it so well, put in so much effort? Because if you've got a passion, there's very likely somebody else on the internet, numerous people on the internet are going to have that same kind of passion. And yes, you might not become a millionaire, you might not become the richest person out there, but I think it is possible to make a living from your passion when you've got the the internet. So yeah. I always tell people, yeah, chase your dreams now. Do you do you think your YouTube helped your consulting business? Yes. And how 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 would it have turned out if you didn't have a YouTube channel? So the YouTube channel was was huge because you can imagine I would make a video called How to Build a Capital Model. Someone then watches the video and they might not understand it, but they can get a feel that, oh, the person talking about it understands what they're saying. They then reach out to me. Hey, can you build build us a capital model? So what was lovely with the YouTube channel was I was getting clients in America and Mm. in England, um, you know, getting this international reach. And especially when you're charging in rands, you're coming across a lot cheaper than the consultants overseas. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really cool. And then I started, there was this lady who found my YouTube channel and she was like, listen, I used to work at one of the big consultancy companies. I'm setting up something called Actuatech, Tech, which is actuary and technology kind of mm-hmm. put together. Mm-hmm. Why don't you kind of come under my wing and I'll feed you the clients, you know, and we can do this kind of stuff together. Yeah. And I did that for, what was it? Was it nine months? And then, then COVID started coming. And then it was it was a very interesting conversation with, with her because she said, oh, it's COVID now, expect to do more work and I'm going to pay you less. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's like, what? You know, like if it's going to, it's either going to be, okay, get paid less, you know, work less. Work less or, yeah. you know, th- those two things should kind of work in tandem. And I was just like, no, you know, I'm not prepared to do that. And then also at the same time, I got the government tender to build an insurance uh, mm. course. And it was because I could show all the videos I had made that they could see, oh, okay, this person knows how to teach. You know, mm. so I made a whole thing. It was called Enterprise Risk Management and, you know, how normal businesses can use insurance and other techniques to prepare for, you know, catastrophe. And yeah. just going through COVID was so apt at the time. Mm. Mm. So that was kind of like that transition away from from that kind of kind yeah. of role and then back to doing a little bit of consulting in my own capacity. Um but yeah, like I say it's the nice thing about being a consultant is you can do it for a bit, you can take some time off. Yeah. You can do it for a bit, you can take some time off. Yeah. yeah. And I think that suits my personality. Having a job 9 to 5 5 days a week. I'm like the worst employee on Wednesday. I'll be amazing <laughs> on Monday and Tuesday. I'll get a lot of stuff done. You know, I'll be hyperactive, yeah. almost annoying. And then Wednesday and Thursday, I'm like, mm, who wants done to go for another this. coffee break? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You, you know, um, I did a lot of templates because um, I'm doing some, I'm into software development and whatnot. Those templates, it was just me learning a technology, mm-hmm. but just listen, let me just build a, uh, an app. Mm. So I built like two pages of the Capitec app. I built two pages of like all my favorite, all the apps I use often on my phone. Okay. Right. And then maybe like four or five months later, then I was getting contacted like, yo, do you, you seem to be enjoying this? You know what I mean? And that time, lucky enough, I was using technology that was not known for mobile apps yet. Mm-hmm. And the company behind it was really trying to push that. Like we are trying to build mobile apps with this. Okay. This is what we're building. You know what I mean? It's called Ionic. Ionic. I know Ionic. Yeah, but it's the, the the blue ring with the dot in the middle. The blue ring with the dot in the middle. Yes. But then they 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 had um, Ionic View, Ionic React, but no no Ionic Angular and Ionic React. Mm-hmm. 
not ionic view yet and i'm a, i'm a view developer okay. so it's like ah since they are doing an ionic view thing let me see because i've always wanted to build mobile apps mm-hmm. i'm a web developer most of the time i don't really build mobile apps but i was just not keen to learn like all these other technologies at the time that they were used so I was like okay let me just build this right anyway fast forward to like a year later and now people are like now there's a big push towards building from the companies that are working with view there's a big push to do mobile apps mm. and they keep finding my templates mm, okay they keep finding these templates they keep finding these templates and yeah sure enough i was always getting side gigs on some can you just come in and just show us how to do it or our developers are not really sure about this and then you just come in and then you just build it for them or mm-hmm. at least help them build it you know i'm saying this to say that especially for people trying to find their way in 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 any career path sometimes just do youtube just do tutorials blogs anything to get your name out there um ultimately that's going to feed into you getting a better offer here a job offer there you know what i mean um and i think it's very important i, I always i always felt like youtube is underutilized in south africa mm-hmm. especially with tutorials with educational content mm. um so when i saw your your channel i was like this is this is you, you add a bit of not too serious stuff here and there which i think is great because <laughs> for someone like me i have no interest in what you're doing but i'm like ah actual jokes so let's see <laughs> let's see you know they're like okay yeah that's not funny okay that's funny or maybe i don't understand it but for someone who's in that field mm-hmm. it's very it, it's it's a way to get your name out there i, I, I found this the f- you know i don't know i've got a very cynical view towards um universities at the moment because i think yeah we go there we spend a lot of money spend a lot of time a lot of energy to get this degree and then we think that this degree is a ticket to getting a job mm. and yes for some um, employers they're like okay do you have it it's a tick box and that kind of thing mm. Mm. but there's so much competition now to get a job that it's not good enough to tell people what you know you have to show people what you know like if you were to hire an artist you wouldn't go to, if the artist came to you said oh i'm the best artist i know how to use every single brush i went to yale i did this i did that you'd be like okay i don't care show me what you've done yeah you know show show me your your pictures and then i will mm. determine whether you're an artist mm. or or not mm. or if you're the the right fit for for the project i have in mind mm. Mm. and i think that's what was great about youtube was yeah people could see oh okay this is how michael's building the model oh this is the technology he's using oh this is how he goes through the documentation oh okay that's actually what we want that's what we're looking for yeah because you just go on the internet and you tell someone you can build a capsule model okay. they'll be like okay um show like like yo where's that portfolio and if you go oh no no all the models are confidential mm. or you know i'm not going to show you the model until you've it's So having that YouTube channel that just demonstrates your competence is so yeah, so valuable. And you don't have to even get a big following. You if you just having those videos out there, if you get three subscribers and they, you know, your mom, your dog and your potential employer, that's enough. You know, just for them to come on, yeah. they do some research on you say, "Oh, look, he's made a whole video showing how he built an app or showing mm. how he did this, mm. how he did that." Mm. Cool. He's less of a risk than hiring somebody who hasn't done that. Yeah. And so if I was an employer, I'd be like, okay, cool. Let me rather go with this person than the unknown. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even now, well, about a month ago, a friend of mine, his website is with I think he built it with Wix. Okay. You know what I mean? And okay, I must be honest. I didn't like the platform for the very long for a very long time, but I was like, if this website is with Wix and I don't really know Wix, let me just build a few other side projects on Wix just for me to be familiar with the platform mm-hmm. before I can work on this guy's website. And sure enough, I did that here and they built and one thing I always do is I always build the same thing. If I'm trying new technology, I just build the same thing over and over again mm-hmm. because there's no point in me trying to think, oh, what else can I build now? Mm-hmm. I'm just going to build the same thing with a different platform. And yeah, sure enough, I was like, okay, cool. I can work on your Wix website now because at least now I'm comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Even though he was a friend, I didn't want to be like, let me just play around and see if I can make this work. Because if I leave it in a state that's like worse than what it was, then it's going to be problems. Yes. Um but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of value in that and I don't think a lot of people understand. Let's talk YouTube. YouTube, yes. 
you have two channels. Um, why why did you decide with you to, to go to YouTube? Like, what was that? Ah, I think YouTube is the place. So it actually happened unintentionally in the sense that what was happening, this is what, this is 20, 2013. So back 2013, I'm writing my, one of the big actuarial exams. Yeah. And this is a non-mathematical exam. You have to know everything about pension funds, everything about life insurance, everything about general insurance, everything about asset management, everything about medical aids. It, it's, it's a monster exam. It's an exam that's written over three days. It is, it is very, very scary. I mean, in order for me to have passed it, I took all the past papers and I even built an actuarial model to predict what topics were going to come up in my exam, just and then focusing on those ones because they require you to have such incredible depth. So there was a lot. There was really, really a lot to learn. So I thought, you know what? Let me make like study notes on the, on the video, like PowerPoint presentation, talk myself through it. Mm-hmm. Um, like we had a, even had this weird acronym called Caterpillar and that stood for all the things you need to consider before you make an international investment, you know, so okay. currency and I've forgotten what the A is and tax and expense, you know, you have like this whole whole list. So I started making video study notes. I just put it on YouTube because, oh, I could then watch it on my phone or the computer or the TV while I eat, while I'm driving the car, I can listen to it, all that. So I make these videos, put it up there. And like the next day I got 60 subscribers. And I was like, and they're like, chirping me saying oh you got this wrong or mm. that's a weird accent where are you from you know like, <laughs> like not relevant stuff and it was it was cool it was like okay these people are now almost like fact checking my notes so mm. my, my original name was mj the student actually and that was a much nicer name to have because then you could get away with making mistakes you know you could just be like mm, oh these are my studies. student yeah where fellow carries a lot more like oh you should know what you're talking about mm. But I wanted to show the students that, hey, I, I had graduated, you know, I, I had entered the fellowship. But yeah, so I just started making these things. And then, yeah, the the views started coming in. Then there was this Canadian girl who had an actuarial channel. And she was called Ella Actri or something like that. And she makes a video of her freaking out, like, who's this weird actuarial channel that's coming up and that's getting all of these views, you know, and but they're just brought her audience to be so it was was, was like, this just like being negative and not being negative being being more like like who who the hell is this guy okay um and that that kind of started bringing so people know, now want to see who yes, is this guy yes who, and then they find and content. then of course as you said i was making i was making silly videos like i had the five myths about actuarial science and i think myth number five was that if you get a hundred percent for all the exams you know you get an invitation from the illuminati you know like so just stupid things like that and and yeah it kind of like there yeah there were some videos that were a little bit silly and and fun and me mm. just kind of fooling around and it was interesting because i would then create another channel um, that was originally called MJ Reads the Bible. And I don't know, it was, I was one day at work, I was just, like I said, I'm very good on Mondays and Tuesdays, but, you know, I then have my my dip. So I have my dip. I've got no interest in doing actuarial work. So I pull up a, a PowerPoint presentation and I make a, a silly, you know, 15 slides of the top 10 saints mm-hmm. and their superpowers. Because one saint had this power of biolocation. They could give mass in two places at the same time. This other saint could levitate. This other saint, when he broke the bread, it actually turned into flesh and blood. And there was it was some weird, weird things that was happening out there. So I make this video on a separate channel. 15 minutes, 15 slides, like I said. Wasn't was very low effort. Yeah. I think that video has now got over 300,000 views. So while I'm busy making the actuarial channel, I'm seeing this religious channel just doing so much better with one video, yeah. <laughs> just doing so much better. And and I think yeah, there's there's definitely more of a a passion in religion. Mm-hmm. Of course, religion is the reason why we have actuarial science, because there's this verse in the book of James that says a, a religious person takes care of widows and orphans. So the Christian community in the church is like we have to take care of widows and orphans when someone dies so they said okay how much should someone put into a fund the premium the man while he's alive 
and how much should the church hold on to the reserves so that when they die they're able to make their payments oh wow really and the church was in a beautiful position because it was doing funerals yeah. so they had a lot of data on death and then so they were able to know or start using maths to determine okay if you're 35 you're more likely to die you know mm. from this and that whether if you're 23 you know this and that and so actuarial science would actually start from the church and kind of, kind of develop and a lot of the early like pioneers in statistics and probability and these things were also very devout uh, catholics or protestants and these type of things so yeah. the two subjects do have quite a nice yeah linkage to together and i guess i even have like a an actuarial argument for my my atheist friends so I'll even sometimes come, and this is like I say, an actuarial argument. So actuaries, we we use something called frequency and severity to determine a premium. Okay. Frequency is how likely something is to occur, and severity is how serious the impact, the consequence. So, for example, if something has going to cause a million rand damage, but has a one percent chance of occurring, you combine that percentage and that amount to compare it to say something that has got a two hundred thousand rand chance of happening, okay, yeah. but a fifty percent chance. You know, you can now take these two dimensions, bring them into a single one in order to compare. Yeah. So I'll go to my atheist friends and I'll say to them, I'll be like, you know what, guys, let's say the existence of God is unlikely, as in it's less than 50%, maybe it's even close to 0%. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's unlikely. And I, and I say to them, you know, philosophically, you can't say that anything has a 0% chance of, of happening or being true or existing because, you know, we live in such a weird and wonderful universe. Anything potentially happen. Might be small but nothing's got a probability of zero. And if the atheist, you know, agrees on that kind of front, they're like, okay, so there's a possibility of God. Mm. God, by definition, severity is infinite. You know, he's the highest, the ultimate, whatever kind of thing. Mm. So if you take infinity and you multiply it by a non-zero positive number, the outcome is still infinity. And that just goes to show that even if the likelihood of God is very low, it should still be the most important thing in everybody's lives. Even be though it's low. Even though, if, even, so even though, even if, so what we'll say is we don't know what the frequency is. Right. It could be 99%, it could be 1%, it could be 0.5%. But even if we don't know and we assume it's the lowest, the fact that God by definition severity is, is infinite, it means that it should be the most important thing in our life compared to let's say your job which yes has got a much higher likelihood of it existing mm -hmm. but the seriousness of your job versus say a higher power it's kind of like hmm okay the higher power is the better one of course that's just the start because now it's like well then why christianity and not islam mm -hmm. you know why not mm -hmm. hinduism one and that's it's like okay fine the actuarial science doesn't tell you which one but it says you should start searching or it's the most logical thing to do in mm -hmm. one's life mm -hmm is to pursue the spiritual paths and, and check it out. So are these the things you cover uh, on business intelli uh, Bible intelligence? So I think I've made, I've made some videos on the apologetic side. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm more about building content for Christians to enjoy. Okay. So what we're doing is we're, let's say you take the, like a book, um, Samuel 1, Samuel 2. I always joke, I'm like, God loved that story so much, he greenlit a sequel. That's where we got Samuel too. Mm. And that, <laughs> <laughs> that's, of course, the story of David and Goliath. But David and Goliath is just one chapter in this crazy epic where, you know, it's if you think Game of Thrones is is drama, read Samuel 1 and Samuel like Game 2. Of Thrones. It's, 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 I, don't, I don't get the hype, but okay. Okay, this is better. This is better than Game of Thrones. So... Mm -hmm with all the political and family backstabbing yeah. and even love stories going wrong. And, you know, David does some despicable things, even though he's the hero. But when you read it in the Bible, it's written as a historical record. So it says, in the year of whatever, David went and did this. He fought Goliath. He killed so many. You get the AI to retell it. And it goes, mm. as the shadow cast over the room, you know. David's face was downfall. Saul came into, you know, and like it just adds in this drama, this epicness. And now you're like, mm, I want to hear what's going to happen. Or like sometimes the Bible is really bad at being, say, a storybook. Like you read Exodus, the prophet says what's going to happen, 
then the thing happens and then they celebrate and sing a hymn about what's just happened. Mm. You know, there's no suspense. There's no tension. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, whoa, spoiler alert. <laughs> so where's the AI? And that's what, like when you tell the stories to kids, um, you don't read directly from the Bible. Yeah. You've got those storybooks. This essentially is doing that for, for adults. Mm. And you're getting the AI also the voice to to dramatize it, the, the script, bringing it all together. And it's a, it's a lovely experience. So so take me through, uh, let's say, um, one video, an episode, right? From concept to using AI, I, I just want to see how everything comes in. Mm, comes together. Together, yeah, yeah. So, okay, yeah. So what I'll do is... Fortunately, I've been a Christian my my whole life. You know, mm. grew up in the church, went to Pentecostal church, went to a Catholic school. So, you know, been reading the Bible. So I'm I'm a little bit familiar with it. So I kind of know, okay, what are the big main stories? But you can also go to ChatGPT and say, what are the big stories in, in mm. the Bible? So mm. Mm. recently I've just made a video on Gideon. And Gideon's pretty cool because, you know, like there was that big movie about the Spartans with the 300 men. 300, yeah. 300, Okay. Gideon is a very similar story like that. It's just Gideon with 300 men going up against an invading army. And God tells him, leave the swords behind. Just take a trumpet. You know, it's, it's a crazy story. It really, really is crazy. So what I do is, now, Gideon is a story that comes from the book of Judges. And again, it's written in a very factual, you know, how things happen. I'll go to chat GPT. I say, I want to write uh, Gideon. I want it to be dramatic. I want it to be epic. I want it to be easy to flow. You know, you you go in with your prompt. You tell exactly what you want. This is the book. Mm. What are the contents? What are the chapters? And you, I don't have to tell ChatGPT more chapters because sometimes ChatGPT is lazy. Like if you don't push it, yeah. it's going to try to write short and whatever. So you push ChatGPT to give you a really nice script. You generate that script. I then go to another website called Eleven Labs, where I actually just won a grant with them because they like what I've been doing. Mm. So I can now use their technology for free, which is pretty cool nice. because before it was like $100 a month and a limitation. So now I've got, yeah, got that for free. You go, boom, you pump that into Eleven Labs and it'll generate the audio. Every now and again, there'll be like a hiccup in the mm. AI. Mm. So you have to listen and do a little bit of sound editing. Yeah, yeah. And then what I'll do is I'll either go to Mid Journey and create like a, a thumbnail image. So Gideon, it's you know it's him there standing with a trumpet instead of a sword amongst his three hundred army, or you can go to a website called Kyber.ai. So all the, the the thumbnails and the the images on on the videos created by by AI. That's yeah. all prompts. A, AI is making the script. AI is reading the story. AI is drawing the thumbnail. There's even Kyber now that can make the um, like a video, like, you know, like those images that morph and do all that mm -hmm, kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like moving still images. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's, it's more, it's very dreamlike at the moment. So it's not perfect, um, but it's going to get better. And then the one that's come out, I've been playing with it just this week and it's called uh, Suno AI. And that allows you to make songs. So for Gideon, I made a, a heavy metal song of Gideon. So you can imagine this like rock band <laughs> singing about the 300 men. You know, we don't need a sword. Yeah, we just need yeah. our trumpet, you know? And it's like, so, <laughs> but. Uh, I, who would have ever thought that? I guess, I guess it happens like heavy metal and just religion. Just It's, oh, I yeah. even came with the cool rock band name. <laughs> I called it Upon This Rock. Yeah. Because, you know, Jesus got this thing where he says to Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church. So hmm. I'm just calling it upon this rock. So you can make your, you can now make these side rock bands and everything like that. <laughs> the worship group is called White Flag because mm -hmm. it's surrender yourself to Jesus, so White Flag. Um, and then I've made an EDM group called Seven Eyes, just because that sounds psychedelic. And in the book mm. of Revelations, the lamb which represents Jesus has got seven eyes, which is very creepy. Um, but, you know, you lean into these, these kind of things. And yeah, so we're going to get to the stage where Let's say yeah, you want to learn about the story of Gideon. Mm. You can either listen to the AI retelling. You can listen to a heavy metal song. You can listen to a worship song on it. You can see a whole bunch of AI images generated. So ultimately, it's an educational experience using mm. a whole vast variety of things. So before, the kids had to just go to Wikipedia and read up on Gideon yeah. and, and maybe see an image here or there. Now you know, it's like so much more multimedia to play with. Yeah, you, you know... For the longest time, um, so I was never really academically like brilliant. 
I was always like 50%, just just pass and then mm-hmm. you're good, you know. But I always had this thing that, because I listened to a lot of music, like from high school. If I got someone to just rap, mm. sing my my study notes, I'm sure I would have done a way better than it's, how, it's you know what I mean? It's happening now. With with this technology, you can, you can do it. I mean, I made, because I was the stuff around a lot. So while I'm making my thing mm. for the channel, I'm stuffing around. I go to ChatGPT and I said, write a punk rock song with lyrics that incorporate the following. And I put my name, my card number, my brother's name, because I race against him, his card number, my dad being the mechanic, mm. this corner, that corner, you know, how we speed up <laughs> for over here, who our big rival is, this, that, you know, give it like a whole bunch of context. Yeah. This thing writes a song and played now with punk punk rock and it's it's amazing. It even goes into like a little guitar solo after it does this thing. And I just, I'm literally made it this morning before I came here. So I can't wait to play it for my dad and my brother. They're gonna be, yeah. I think they're gonna be blown away because you can imagine this is a song that is incredibly specific to our situation. Mm. And my brother's always trying to find music to put to, because he'll upload the GoPro footage of the karting yeah, race. Yeah, yeah. And he's always trying to find music and royalty free music. Uh. Now he can make, he can literally say, like how the race goes, oh, I overtook this guy at this corner, then this happened, oh, then my tire blew up. And he can put in those facts, ChatGPT can write it. So while you're watching the video, the song is incredibly it's relevant amazing. to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's amazing. It's, oh, I mean, yeah. to to if you want to if you want to flirt with the with the ladies now, you just take you know <laughs> all the details of your last date, put it in ChatGPT, write us write a little poetry, then you say <laughs> jazz song, send it to her. You know, right, baby, right. come back. You know, <laughs> but it's all relevant. It's their name. It's your name. It's these things. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So you you are waiting for your plaque. Mm-hmm. How 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 is that? How are you feeling right now? Is is that amazing or what? I mean, yeah, oh, gosh, sh- it was. Is that a hundred hundred thousand subscribers? Hundred thousand subscribers on Bible Intelligence. On Bible Intelligence, yes, yes. Eesh. So look, it's it's exciting. It's kind of. I mean, it's weird. You kind of like. Want the plaque to be like, oh look, I am a YouTuber, you yeah, know, to like yeah. kind of kind of have that that saying. So hoping the postman doesn't lose it, um, but yeah, it should be coming on on Tuesday. On so, Tuesday, yeah, can't wait yeah, to, yeah. to hang that up. So maybe you're gonna write a, an AI script <laughs> as a, a way to to address the audience. <laughs> like, I got it. To, yeah. Yes, that could be. So the Bible Intelligence Channel got to a hundred k subscribers before. The, the first line. channel. Mm. How is that possible? Well, you must imagine actuarial science. It's only people who are writing these actuarial exams. Mm. Mm. I mean, in South Africa, okay. at any given time, I think there's less than a thousand students. Maybe in the UK, there's five thousand. Maybe America, ten thousand. Mm. India, ten thousand. Mm. You know, you kind of like add all of those together, and you see, yeah, my subscriber count there's like around thirty-five thousand. Mm. It's, it's almost like that's the student population of of actuaries. Whereas you look at say Christians, there's mm. you know, there's there's billions of us. And there's a good proportion of them that are also on the internet. So I think a lot more people well, you can imagine everybody would be a little bit interested in a little bit on, you know, what does the Bible say? Mm, even, even if atheist. you're not Christian. Even yeah. if you're not Christian or you're atheist or you're from a different religion, it's like the Bible, I mean, it's such been such a huge influence on you know, Western uh, society and, and even globally. And, you know, people quote it, yeah, let me learn a little bit about it. Mm. But if you're not working for an insurance company, you don't care what the moment generating function is and how you calculate the second moment of the Weeble distribution <laughs> and get that parameter in place. You know, you do not care about that. Just not, I know what's my premium. But yeah, you just want to know like, but hey, you might be interested. This Gideon guy, what, did he actually? Because mm. Gideon, he gets an army of 10,000 people. But before he he took up the mantle, he tests God. He says, God, I'm going to leave this fleece outside. If the fleece gets due and the rest of the land doesn't, then I know you, that this is legit. legit. So yeah. he does it and it happens. Oh, the miracle. Legit. What does Gideon do? No, God. Let's do it again. This time, the Jew must be everywhere but on the fleece. So God's like, okay, you want to you want to test me? I'll I'll play the same game. So Gideon gets his army of ten thousand. God says to Gideon, tell all the guys there that don't want to fight to go home. Mm. 
half the army leaves. Okay, Gideon's like, damn, okay. God's like, no, no, we're not done. Take them down to the water, see how they drink, and we'll just take the, the guys that aren't too, mm. too macho, macho. And then tell them to leave their swords behind. So God tested Gideon. God was like, you know what? I'm not going to you know, return, return that kind of favor, mm. which mm. makes for an epic story. You know, and like I say, everyone now wants to come check it out. The heavy metal song's pretty cool. It leans into that, you know, that moment yeah. of faith. And like I said, you don't have to have any prior knowledge or prior thing to enjoy that story, to be, you know, inspired by it. So I think that's why there was, and, and this is the thing. I got a lot of comments from the actual video saying, oh, wow, Michael, you've helped and I've managed to pass and this has been so meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, what's more important in life? your career or your spirituality? Mm. And to me, spirituality, well, because we're going to be dead longer than we're going to be alive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the afterlife is much longer than the normal life. Yeah. So I was like, Flip, I want to do, if I'm, if I'm able to make an impact, let me try and make an impact in what I think is the most meaningful area. And so even now, like, it's, there's a lot of passion that goes into the, the Bible intelligence one. Mm. The actuarial one, it was like, okay, what can I make a video about now? And it's a bit stale. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. whereas with this Bible one, I kind of feel like there's an infinite amount of content mm -hmm. to be made. Mm -hmm. What is the secret to, because I mean, even your first channel is doing amazing. Mm -hmm. um, what What is the source to like, to get those numbers? My thing is just keep rolling the dice. So just keep pushing out content, mm. push out content, push out content, push out content. I mean, the way these YouTube algorithms work is you put out a content, you roll the dice on it. You know, if you get the six, fantastic, it goes viral, or people watch it, check it out, great. But most of the time you're not rolling a six and the algorithm kind of doesn't pick up on it yeah. or no one gets to, gets to see it. Yeah. But if you want to go viral, if you want your content to be noticed, keep rolling the dice. Keep mm. rolling. I think that's why I do so many different things because it's, it's this thing I've realized that success is chance you know it's uncertainty mm -hmm. which is great because when i fail yes i try to learn from it but i don't take it too personally so if i fail i just I'm like okay what did i do wrong but mainly it was because i was unlucky mm -hmm. but same as when i succeed i don't say oh look at me i'm amazing i know all the answers i can write you know secrets about this stuff i say oh i got lucky you know mm -hmm. it keeps me it keeps me humble so it keeps me humble but it also keeps me from being defeated is having this worldview that uncertainty plays such a big role. And because of that, it's like, yeah, just keep rolling the dice. Keep trying mm. again and again and again and again and mm. again. I mean, one of the things I'm thinking now with TikTok is if your video doesn't go viral on TikTok, delete your TikTok account and start a new TikTok account. Because <laughs> the algorithm in TikTok is a little bit crazy like that. Um, this, whoa, the effort. So, yeah, yeah. So like you legit, get, delete it and then... Delete it and... So, I mean, I, I had a... TikTok, I've also, I've got, gosh, I've got a million TikTok channels. Um, <laughs> there was one on karting. And I remember because I got in TikTok early. I was in mm. the thing very, just not as, because it was first called Musical.ly. So I was aware of Musical.ly. And then when it rebranded to TikTok, I was like, okay, let me give this thing a thing a go. And the content was bad back then. Like, oh, mm. it was so bad. So I was putting on some karting content. And the videos were, I mean, yeah, I got one was one or two videos that got over like 100,000 views. And it was quite common to get like 20, 30, 40,000 views mm. on my karting videos. And it was just me spinning the wheel, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like even, <laughs> it wasn't even the craziest of content. Um, and then I noticed, yeah, when you start a, a TikTok channel, it's almost like TikTok wants to keep you on the thing. So mm -hmm. it's almost like they bump your content up a little bit. If it's your first video. Yeah. If your first video gets a little magic bump. Once your channel's old, you've been there for a while, it's very weird how they show it to like almost a certain number and then they stop. And then they stop. So it's almost like they give you that number and it's like that's what your number is. And then and it then stops. It just... So if you yeah, if you restart your channel and you get really good on the first one, then all your mm. others are also going to be – not that I know the TikTok – and I think these things are also constantly changing to prevent people like me from yeah. gamifying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the advice is just keep, you know, keep rolling the dice. And then of course there's the, the advice you'd get, you know, online, which will, which are kind of followed as well. 
comment on similar channels, mm -hmm. you know, don't be afraid to share um, and show your own content, going onto Facebook groups, posting it there, doing it here, you know, like be your own promoter. <laughs> that feels like you're just spamming people every yeah, week. Yeah, like, it's, it, it eats at your soul. <laughs> it's like, should I be doing this? You know? Yeah, it's, yeah. but you got to, yeah, that's, that's also like, Putting so it's almost as much effort as you put into creating your content, mm -hmm. put that same amount of effort into promoting it. Promoting it, yeah, yeah. And repeat. Yeah. Cool. So there's a lot of um fear, so to speak, in the media about AI. Mm -hmm. Will it ultimately like replace humans? You know, there's a lot of, of that going around. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be so involved in it. Like everything you do, you just wanna mm. do it with AI. Where where so I guess the question is humans versus AI and maybe sub point would be the responsibility aspect of it, right? Can you maybe speak to that? Mm. So I like to, well, not that I like to give, I, I heard this analogy, which I really liked. And the person said, what's better at flying? A bird or that American F-35 fighter jet? And the F-35 fighter jet can, you know, sub or supersonic speeds and, mm -hmm. you know, do all this crazy stuff. And it's like, of course, the poor bird has to worry about its own reproduction, has to worry about repairing itself, feeding itself, and it's limited to organic material. Whereas, oh, and it's coming from a little egg. So it has to start in the small thing and kind of grow. Yeah. Where this jet is made in a factory, purpose built with the latest technology, latest materials, of course, it's going to be better. Now think about the computer and the human brain. Again, we limited by our size. We limited by the fact that we have to feed ourselves, you know, reproduce, do all of these things and organic material where the machine isn't, doesn't have those limitations. Mm. So is AI better than humans? Yes. If not now, definitely will be, you know, in time. Um, what is, okay, what does better look like? What would, yeah. What so, is, well, just think, a calculator can do long division instantly. It takes me about two minutes, you know. <laughs> it can do integrals also instantly. That takes me maybe five minutes. You know, so already we're seeing, I mean, the calculator is a machine brain. So we've, we've lived in a society mm. where we've had a super maths brain. <laughs> we're now living in a society that's also got a very good language brain. You know, we've gone from numbers to language. And of course, numbers represent information, but language can represent so much more different types of information. So I don't think this AI is as, as new as everybody thinks it is because we've had True. it with numbers. True. We just now have it with language. And yes, AI can write better poetry than me. AI can write a better love letter than me. AI can write, you know, just better books than me. And it's going to just keep getting better and better and better. And then... One thing I get from people like in the church, they're like, oh, but you know, it's not human and therefore it's not got the spirit of the Lord and all this stuff. And I say to them, to me, AI is more human than me. Because think about it. I've been around, so it's my birthday tomorrow. So I'm going to be 32 tomorrow. So I've been on this earth for 32 years. Wow, shout out. Thank you, thank you. Getting a plaque and then it's your birthday. Yeah. It's like a nice birthday gift. Best, best present to get. <laughs> so I've been human yeah. for 32 years. An AI that has been reading data on millions of humans over the past 6,000 years has got a lot more human years than me. So in my view, the AI is more human than me if we consider humanity as being, you know, human is what your past experiences were. Mm -hmm. So the AI has gone through a lot more emotions, a lot more experiences. And it's not just one source. And not just from, from millions of people over the past mm -hmm. 6,000 years. So the thing's more human than me. So anyone who says, oh, it's not human. <laughs> I'm like, well, how are you defining you defining humanity? And I guess, look, if you're using the physical definition of human, yeah. like, oh, meat and bones. Yes, yeah. the AI is not meat and bones. But for me, being human is more about, you know, cognitive, how we think psychologically, you know, our ideas. And the AI is beating us on that, that front. I am excited for it, I think, because this is also a weird thing. Is people people think jobs are a good thing. <laughs> and I'm like, maybe your paycheck is the good thing. 
or being able to buy what you get with your paycheck is the good thing. Yeah. But if you can get what you need, <laughs> you know, from a from a better system, and you don't need the paycheck, and then you don't need the job, then you don't have to go through all that unwanted effort. Yeah. Because I've got a I've got a feeling that money is going to disappear in our future. Because think the whole reason why we have money. That's what they said about um, crypto. Well, it came came out. I think crypto is a better form of money in the sense that you look at money. We use it as a tool to remember who has contributed to our society so who can extract from society. Mm -hmm. That's what it was originally designed for. Of course, inheritance and all these other things has kind of stuffed it up because now, you know, if your parents are rich, you're going to be rich. So, and that's why I think it's a bad technology because yes, while it solved the problem of memory, it introduced these other, you know, weird uncertainties. And we know that it's this memory kind of tool because anthropologists show that people didn't used to barter within communities. They might maybe bartered amongst communities, so this tribe and this tribe. But internally, it was more of a IOU memory thing. Oh, mm. you brought water, mm. you can share in the hunt uh, today. Oh, you, you shared in the hunt today, you can build you know, a shelter tomorrow. But we needed to get our tribe numbers bigger because if this tribe had more people, they'll come in and kill us. But the more people we got, the harder it was to remember who, who was doing stuff and keeping doing people in check. Because yeah. of course, if you're not you know, pulling your weight, we're going to ostracize you and kick you out. So we needed to introduce a token system to try and remember what people were doing. Mm -hmm. And shells were used, but you didn't want a kid to walk on the beach and become a millionaire. Mm -hmm. So gold was great because it took a lot of effort to extract the gold. And mm -hmm. because it took a lot of effort to extract the gold, you knew that people weren't going to spend their entire lives just mining gold or if they're going to do that that will be their job and that's their value add mm. to society mm. and just to kind of like yeah almost tie it up with religion money and religion are very similar in the sense that you need the whole community to believe in it for it to be powerful and like you look at the americans they have on their money in god we trust because mm. if we didn't trust money who would care about it and the Romans also kind of knew this because they would write their goddess's name on their gold tokens they would write, so they even minted their money in a temple because they understood the connotations between money and, and religion. And do you know which um, Roman goddess they, they minted their money in? No. So her name was Monita. This is where we get the word money from. They type M-O-N-E-T-A, and that would you know, become, in English, turn into the word money. Hmm. So Monita was the name that was printed on all these tokens. And what was she the goddess of? She was the goddess of memory. So money is a memory device so we know who should extract value from the community in that. If the AI is doing all the work and the AI is providing people with everything that they need, yeah. maybe not what they want, but with what they need, you could almost argue that we won't require money mm. in our future because the AI will know what we deserve. It's very scary. And that's why it's fine. Do away with the jobs because we're going to do away with money. And the thing is, to maybe give a little bit of hope or bring it back, I play a lot of chess. AI has figured out chess. Mm. No one can beat the AI in chess. Mm. But we still play chess. We still enter tournaments. We still do it. We still, you know, mm. why? Because there's fun. There's an enjoyment in it. Mm. Mm. So, yes, I think there'll still be people who will write music, who will write books, who will program, who will do all of these things. We'll still work, but it won't be a job. It won't be something that we compiled or that we have to do. Yeah. It'll be something that we want to do. Yes, and the A will probably be like, that's cute. Let me do it better for you now. Uh, you know, it'll be like, great. We're not going to use it, but <laughs> Effort. glad that you felt better. <laughs> yeah. um, I've got a friend, he calls it the horsification of humans. He says, just how machines have made horses irrelevant and they're now pets. Mm. He says, mm. humans mm. are going to become like horses. So we're still going to be running around in the fields, having a great time, but we're not going to be needed for the economy <laughs> to, to be pushed forward. And I'm, I'm excited for that. I think things like poverty inequality, you know, those things are going to start to diminish mm. as we start getting an abundance and better allocation of resources. I mean, just think about it. Imagine if the AI ruled all the governments and there was just no corruption amongst the entire world. But then the, there's a possibility that the people behind the scenes mm -hmm. are going to be corrupt. So they're going to 
build these AI tools in their favor. Well, this is this is where hopefully if we get true AI or what they call artificial general intelligence or super artificial intelligence mm-hmm. or meta AI or whatever you want to call it, it won't depend on human input. It will transcend. It will kind of rise above okay. its thing. It will determine its own values and that. That's why I'm very we mustn't tell the AI, oh, we want equality at all costs because then it might just kill us all because then we're all equal if we're all dead. You know, we need to... We need to <laughs> Is that the only form of true equality? You, you know, know... We all die. Well, well, well if it, that's the path to the least resistance. Like, if we told the AI to optimize for the goal of just equality, it'll be like, oh, let's just bring everyone down because it's better effort than, say, bringing people up. So you want to say equality and life and fairness and abundance and you know so i think how we but this is what the great thing with the the general ai yeah it'll be able to figure out what those goals should be otherwise it's pretty dumb you know we don't want to have a dumb ai mm-hmm. so i'm not even too too phased by that i think before we reach the state of paradise yeah. that i've described we are going to go through a little bit of a you know just like the, the israelites they didn't just go straight into the promised land mm. they first went through the desert and so once we lose the tyranny of Egypt or our jobs and the current system, there's going to be this awkward period of readjusting, not mm. knowing what's going to happen mm. before we get to the paradise, the promised land, the AI land of abundance. Mm. And I think our generation is going to have to, we're going to be the leaders during that time. And that's why I think it's still critical that we study, we put in effort, we try to figure out political systems, governance, philosophy, mm. psychology, and we, I think our kids won't have to, you know, because that will be embedded. And they'll only have to do that if they want to. But I think our generation has got this responsibility. You're asking about that. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, okay, let me learn AI as much as I can. Let me understand it. Let me play with it. Let me figure it out. Let me almost become an AI handler so that when these things start happening, I can hopefully, you know, add my voice to the thing. Let me, let me, let me, let me. Let's let's try this. You see the setup here, mm-hmm. right? There's a control room at the back, right? Deets is there doing his thing. Do you think AI will get to this level where you set up well, no setup, but it looks like like this? So I've got I've got two AI podcasts on my channel where there's an AI host who asks questions. And then there's two people. I even gave them names, <laughs> Maria and Alex, which is weird. It's weird giving the, the AIs names. And Maria is a conservative Catholic and Alex is a progressive Protestant. And they talk about everything from homosexuality to this, to this, to that, you know. And it's lovely to see that, that dialogue that they go through. It is still a little bit robotic, but like I say, in time, the AI will be like, hmm, why, why wasn't this perfect? Or how is it different from the Joe Rogan experience or what we're doing mm, here? Mm. Be like, okay, let me maybe add in a few more ums, a few more awkward silences, a few more this, a few more that, mm. so that it comes across a lot more natural. And I think the AI is going to get to that point. We're also going to have, yeah, video is going to reach a level where you're going to simulate. You, you can make your podcast. I'm, I think you're going to be able to do this very soon, where you can sit there and you put on maybe your goggles or whatever your your things is that Oculus that uh, Facebook's that making. That thing that um, Lux Lux Friedman. Yes, yes, that with, he did with, with uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'll be able to summon some weird That's philosopher right. from the past. So Frederick Nietzsche <laughs> could be sitting here, That's wild. and you can ask him questions, and he will talk to you in his style. I think it's a bit of a German accent, hopefully in English, so everyone can understand. And you will be able to have a conversation with Fred. But then you'll realize, you know what, why should I be the host? Let me get Diogenes or some other Greek philosopher to engage with Nietzsche but will, and will throw be, a little topic out there. Will it there. be as real as... Because you see, when you just... Let's take pictures, for example. The mm-hmm. pictures are so airbrushed, you know, so mm-hmm. so smooth, so dreamy. So perfect. No, that's not that's, that's like, like not that word. <laughs> not that word. So I, I can't imagine like something like a video where this kind of interaction, you know, the 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 me jumping in, mm-hmm. you know, are we gonna get there eventually? I I don't see it. Do you know where, where what I think we're gonna happen? 
is we're going to have dynamic content. So I'm going to wake up in the morning and the AI is just going to know, oh, Michael's in this mood because I've got the little Fitbit or whatever. <laughs> he's sad. He's happy. He wants to learn. It'll know what I want. I'll then go into TikTok or whatever new app is called, and it will create on the fly the perfect content for me, the perfect duration, the perfect thing, and it'll be just for me. I'll watch it. It'll be amazing, and then it will get deleted. So it could be this entire, imagine this entire podcast, this whole experience, tailor-made for just one individual. And I mean, already we, we were tending towards that. Like back when we were kids, we all kind of watched the same stuff on, mm. what was it, like on Mnet. We all saw the same mm. movie on a Sunday night or the same Dragon Ball Z episode in the morning. So when we came to school, we could all talk about the same thing. The kids today don't have that because someone's maybe watching Minecraft videos on YouTube. Somebody else watching Vampire Diaries on Netflix. Somebody's watching, I don't just know. Just recommendations that are different. Yes, they just we were just watching so many different things that we're struggling to communicate with each other. And I think that's going to be one of the problems we're going to have. People aren't going to have a lot in common with each other. I mean, I was at UJ last year um, and talking to the, the head librarian there, and they're like, no, they're setting up events to try and get the students to be more social with each other. And I was like, you have to help the students be social at university. You know, like one this place is, with students is just like yeah, hyper social. Exactly. And it's. And, you know, they were blaming it on COVID and this and that kind of stuff. But I think it's because our entertainment has been fractured. But I think that's the way it's it's tending towards that We will all have our own specific content that we will watch. Mm. And it, my fear is that it might start causing isolation amongst people. And I think this is the lovely thing about religion, whether it's Christianity, Islam, any religion, is that it does give people that common common ground that sense of identity. So mm. if I make a joke about Gideon, you, you'll laugh, you'll get it. You know, if I make a joke about something else that I've watched and you haven't, mm. there's that disconnect. So I think, yeah, that's also one of the things I want to try to do is make the religious content. I mean, I almost see Netflix as my, my competitor in the future. You know, I want to start making content that starts rivaling the streaming mm. services. You know, people say, like I say, oh, forget Game of Thrones. Let's watch David and Goliath. You know, I want to get to mm. to that level of quality mm. and content. So yeah, please, AI, bring it on. Bring bring this this technology. Have these awesome videos. We're gonna have a uh, David slinging his stone, throwing it at the giant. Yeah. It's gonna be awesome. Okay, cool. So has AI played a part in your cutting thus far? Oh, not yet. C- cutting. <laughs> we we call cutting. Uh, yeah, it's it's a weird one because. You know, I do approach the sport from a scientific point of view. I look at all the various parameters and it's a little bit overwhelming because there's numerous amounts. There's all the front end geometry that you can do, toe in, toe out with mm-hmm. the, the wheel alignment, the rear track, then the engine's got multiple settings from the jetting to the flow height. Like it's just insane, all the things that you can tweak. Then you have the track that is a, it's a living organism. You know, sometimes it's hot, sometimes there's sand, sometimes there's a lot of grip. So you can do all these facts that you can control. And then this one is a bit of a joker. And then your tires every lap are changing. They're either getting hotter or they're wearing out Mm. and this, that. So to model it from a scientific point of view, it's beyond my capabilities. And as an Mm. actuary, I'm supposed to be good at modeling. You know, Mm. like that's one of the Mm. things we, we pride ourselves in. And I did attempt to do it with karting, but it was beyond me. Mm. AI, maybe, maybe, you know. Um, I know, I remember talking to ChatGPT at the beginning of this year about karting and that, and was talking about suspension. And I was like, you know, karts don't have suspension. Um, And that's also like an interesting thing why, I mean, why I think Bible intelligence is the right fit for AI and maybe karting isn't. Religion well, karting, we've been, I mean, the DD2 class that I'm in, I don't think it existed maybe 10 years ago. Mm. Maybe it's been going for 10, 15 years at most. And how many people have been writing on DD2 karting? So I write yeah. drive, direct uh, drive with the gears. Uh-huh. It's a very specific type of kart. So maybe 15 years and mm. maybe maybe 100 people have written an article on it. I don't mm. know. Maybe I'm being generous there. The AI doesn't have a lot of information to go on there. Yeah, Religion been writing like say 6,000 years, millions of people. So I think the AI is much better um, at determining 
how to get into heaven and, mm-hmm. you know, how to say a, a perfect prayer and, you know, how to partake in various rituals. But when it comes to karting and the setup, it's very shallow. It's very, very shallow in karting. Mm-hmm. But it's going to get better. I think as more data comes out, as more people start running, I mean, there's a saying that says, the worst AI is ever going to be is today. Today. It's, every day is just getting better. And yeah, hopefully I'm going to be at the forefront yeah. of, of using the technology. And because yeah, the, the dream is to, so for next year, I want to become the national champion of South Africa. So now you, was it this year where you came third? So this year I came third in the regionals for the Western Cape. Okay. The reason why I've got a nice chance at the nationals is because I'm driving in this class where you have to be 32 or older. I was able to sneak in this year because you turn 32 in the year. So I just made it. Um, Not many of the people in my age category do the national circuit. There are some, but Mm -hmm. not that many. So we could have a situation where I could become national champion and my brother is the regional champion. Because my brother's faster than me. But he's got a day job. He's an accountant. <laughs> he's got a kid coming on. You know, he went. He he went like natural this, disadvantage. Yeah, he was like, "This is how life is." You know, you get married, you have kids, you have a job. Where me, I was more like, "Ooh, what else is out there?" So he's very limited with his time. He's mm-hmm. quicker than me. Mm-hmm. Um, karting is like his his ultimate passion. So I think he'll beat me in the regional, but in the national, just because he won't attend the races in Durban yeah. and Joburg and all of this, um, I have a I have a good chance. Yeah. And then, yeah, when you go race, so they had the, the grand finals um, last week. And in my age category, you have ex Formula One drivers that are racing, mm. uh, representing their, their country. So that's pretty cool. You know, it's like the closest I'm going to get to Formula One is racing against the has beens, <laughs> you know, at one of these grand finals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So speaking of Formula One, um, who, who, what's your team? Who, who are you rooting for? You know what? It's 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 horrible to say now because now everyone's like, oh, it's only because he's now winning. But yeah. I remember when Max Verstappen first got into a cart. I just I like that kid. I was like, wow, he's he only thinks Formula One. He mm. only thinks driving. He is just phenomenal. And I mean, I look at that sport, and I don't envy any of the guys there because I I maybe I don't understand, but I think I understand the sacrifice and everything that they had to give up mm. in order to get there. And I think Verstappen's winning because he's just the most determined. He's given up the most. This is this is the only thing really that he pushes towards. So got to respect that. Absolutely. I so, mean, this season, he really like... This season, was I mean... Untouchable. And what, what is so crazy is Formula 1 is so close. I mean, there were races where... The qualifying, we're not talking tenths, hundreds, but sometimes thousands of a second, thousands of a second split, you know, those those guys. I mean, in karting, if we're a few tenths off, we say, oh, that's close. Mm. These guys are a few thousands. And our track is after like 40 seconds. There's it's like one minute and 40 seconds. So it's incredible how close that field is. So for him to constantly be on the top, it's... It's mind blowing. It really is is dominant. So I was a big fan of Vettel, and I think because Verstappen also had the V in his name, mm. and it was like a Toro Rosso kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Like I think that's kind of where I was I was going towards. Um, but yeah, love Max Verstappen. Yeah. He's I, killing the sport. But I was I was a Max <laughs> fan. I won't lie. I was a Max fan for the longest time until Abu Dhabi twenty twenty two. I was like, this guy's an ass. But what did he do wrong? I don't know, man. This is just the way he carries himself, you know? It's just, I was like, nah. But for the longest time, I was like, okay, cool. I am rooting for him. And I just think there's something about the Red Bull and how they handle overtaking. That Red Bull and overtaking is just like mm. amazing. Every driver, like someone can go from like a Daniel Ricciardo. The way he overtakes on a Red Bull versus when he's driving a Alfa Tari, for example. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, it's not the same. It's know? not the same, no, yeah. And then now you put a driver like Max in that Red Bull. It's then you just see flames. So what's your prediction for? Well, well let, me, let me just say two things okay. on that. The one thing is that if it was all Red Bull, if the Red Bull car was the, the secret source behind Max's success, 
where was Checo? No, 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 don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not, wait, I'm not, wait, I'm you not, know, you won one race this whole season. No, no, don't get me wrong. I'm not <laughs> saying, I'm not saying it's because of Red Bull. Max is a beast, mm-hmm. period. But there's just something, when you put a driver like Max mm-hmm. in a Red Bull, no, no, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good combination. Checo, I honestly, I don't think Checo is priority at Red Bull. He's a, he's a, he's a, a perfect second seat driver. Mm. So I don't think there's a lot of cushion around him to put him away. Well, one one other thing, maybe to to defend all racing drivers, is doing karting. I've realised it's 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 more of a mental sport than anything. It's you've got to get yourself in a mindset. You've got to have confidence. You've got to tell yourself you're the best. So. If you're not arrogant, you're not going to become a good Formula One driver. Because mm. you have to tell yourself, I'm the best. I'm the best thing in the world. Would I can break as late is, as is, possible. Is, is uh, Sebastian arrogant? Sebastian Vettel. Mm. He became humble and then he started losing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what's his problem. He's, he cared more about the environment than racing and he just started losing his pace. Okay. He, be, he, <laughs> he became too humble. If you want to be a really great driver... You have to tell yourself you're absolutely the best. Think about it. You're going through these speeds at like 300 kilometers an hour. You're coming up to a corner. If you don't believe that you're the best and that you can turn at the last minute and break, you know, at the latest Mm. possible time, uh, any humble person will be like, oh, I'm going to tap off. I'm going to tap off. But if you're arrogant and you're like, I can do it. And I think this is where Max is so dangerous to his teammates because every other driver can say Max is there because of the machine. And they can maintain their ego that I'm the best thing ever. Alex Albon, you had Pierre Gasly, you had Danny uh, Ricciardo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They all got mm-hmm. fired all they left because he destroyed them mentally. Because they were like, oh my gosh, this guy in the same equipment of me is better than me. And but as soon as you have that thought, you're, you're miserable, you're horrible. I, I, get, I get that, right? On track, right? This is not a, let's just cruise to the finish line. This is... Mm -hmm. I want to be there as fast as possible. But now off track, why do you need to have that switch on all the time? So, look, and I think think this is where where Hamilton's great because I think Hamilton... For example, sorry, you are not arrogant. Yes. But you are top three. (laughs) That's why I didn't win. (laughs) 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 So, but you do, you kind of, you try and suss yourself up and I guess when I'm karting I do try and get myself you know I'll listen to a little bit of Big Sean you mm. know get myself in the mode uh, the zone and and that type of thing but yes after karting five, you don't want to talk to me five minutes after I've been in a cart I'm quite mm. like pumped up on adrenaline and you know maybe say a few swear words if you cross me you know And but I come back down so I, I get in that mode and then I come back down because what I'm racing I've got eight races the entire year mm. Formula One drivers, they got what, like 22, 23? I mean, I've lost count how many races there are. And this is their day job. Everything depends on it. If Everything. I lose a karting race, yeah, yeah. I've still got my AI, I've still got my chessboard, you know, still got my friends. You stop performing in, uh, in Formula One, that's your life. Kick your you life. Off. You know, you'll lose your, your seat, you'll lose your girlfriend probably, you know, you'll lose mm. like your salary. There's a lot. Free traveling. So I think the best thing for them to do is to maintain that ego, to maintain that superiority. So if I was Max's psychologist, maybe it's a good thing I'm not, I would tell him, Max, you're the best. Keep telling mm. yourself you're the best. You're amazing. Surround yourself with people who just say you're the best. Don't go on the internet. Don't look at the haters. You know, like very much have that that mindset. And I think that is what causes, I think maybe all athletes at that level. Yeah. Formula One is, is difficult because there's, so, there's only 20 seats. You know, f- football, like each team has got like a squad of 25 or more or whatever like that. Formula One, there's only two seats per team and it's that grid of 20. That's it. There's not mm. like, oh, the European circuit or, I mean, who cares about IndyCar? You know, it's Formula One. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the thing that, that they're all going for. So, yeah, I think from a mental point of view, it's it's critical. Mm. Absolutely critical. All right, cool. So when when is does your season start next year? Next year, next year we've actually got a, I don't know when the season starts, but I know for the first time in a long time, we've got, it's called the Race of Africa. Mm-hmm. It's coming to Cape Town. Mm-hmm. So before this was in Joburg. And it's this race where everyone in Africa is invited to come down 
And if you win this race, you also get a ticket to the grand final. Mm -hmm. So normally to get a ticket to the grand final, you have to win your national. But because countries like, I think Namibia's got a national, but it, like other countries like Mozambique, Botswana, mm -hmm. you know, these type of places, we don't want to have an incredible talent there that can't be represented at the, so you can have a situation where a kid can come from Nigeria mm. to this race. And if he wins just this one single race, he gets a ticket to represent Nigeria in mm. the, the world finals. And where are the finals? And so the world finals happens around this time, like end of November. Okay. Um, so this will be for next year, but this race of Africa is going to be happening, I think the 20 something of March. Mm. My brother will know the date, you know, cause he's mm. a lot more dedicated than me, but I know somewhere 20, 20th of March, it's going to be a crazy race. It's going to be a lot of fun and job. Winner takes all in a single heat and should have a big grid, a lot of people. Mm. And it's going to be the first time mm. I'm going to be mm. doing it because yeah, it's going to be in Cape Town next yeah. year. So yeah. that's going to be definitely a highlight. Did you go to the Formula E race? I did. I did. So it's going to be the same vibe as that? No, no, no. That Formula E was much, much bigger. Much okay. Bigger. I almost, okay. I almost did a go-kart race for Formula E. So they contacted a bunch of the drivers and they said, because Rotax also got a, an electric cart. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, do you want to jump in and do like some, like a display race? But ultimately, yeah, that didn't materialize. Mm -hmm. But that would have been quite cool because it would have been a couple of South Africans racing some international guys mm -hmm. in an electric cart. I've never driven an electric cart, but, you know, I don't know how difficult it would be compared to the petrol one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's it's not going to be yeah, as glamorous as, as Formula E. Uh, but it should be a lot of fun. So definitely come come check it out. Yeah, sure. I'll definitely talk to you about that and see if I can come check it out. All right, cool. So next year, are you going to be arrogant? Are you going to be number one? That's what I'm <laughs> going to get to. Or are, we still, are we still on the number threes? Like What's, I said, what, what, what is your goal for, for next year? Definitely. Next year's season. I definitely, you know what? Every race I go in to win, you know, mm. you've got to go in with that mindset of I'm going to try... And I did, you know, I did get a pole position last year. Um, I have had fastest lap. So I know I have that ability. I don't have the consistency. So that's what I need to work on. Mm. Work on consistency, mm. on fitness. Um, you know, so there's, I know where I'm going wrong. Mm. And I kind of feel like if I can address that, I can really give, give a good. So my brother came second in the championship, but he ended on equal points to the guy who won. And my brother was winning the last couple of races, like mm. was dominating. So Brother's the biggest competition, but the great thing is we share our data. We drive under the same team. So I can I can use his data to learn. And yeah, I think with that, I should be able to to raise my game. So definitely come second next year. Mm. You know, mm. I won't accept anything less than that. Well, I'll only lose to my brother. <laughs> uh, but hopefully I beat him as well. Or like I say, I'll be happy. Me, national champion, him, regional champion. Yeah. And yeah, we take it from there. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I, actually, you almost went to one of your races. Uh, but yeah, we something else came up, so we couldn't go. Um, but yeah, next year, I'll definitely check it out. Cool, man. I think that's it for now. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for doing this. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Um, um, other than your... Anyone wants to go check out the the AI podcast <laughs> on Bible intelligence and just you know it'll be an interesting contrast after seeing mm. human speak uh, hear the <laughs> AI speak yeah. and I think this one is better at the moment but maybe in five years time mm. or even less the AI will will be giving us your run for our money but yeah until then all right cool <laughs> see you on the next one.